Should the king give Harry and Meghan a new house? Which of the Queen's style secrets did our Rebecca discover this week? And what was Catherine's role in the War of the Waleses? We've got another great show lined up for you today. Hello and welcome to Palace Confidential, the world's best royal programme. Not that I'm biased or anything. I'm Jo Elvin and back this week is the Daily Mail's royal editor, Rebecca English, and the paper's diary editor. And it says here, I don't write these, in-house heartthrob <laughs> Richard Eden. Welcome both. Now, a reminder that if you enjoy our show, please like and subscribe to our free channel to be reminded whenever a new episode arrives. Going to start with you, Rebecca. You're back from a few days gallivanting with the king and queen, or sorry, reporting, working very hard with that limpy, poor, broken toe of well, yours. Well, I was going to say gallivanting was definitely not a word to describe <laughs> me last week, Joe. I'm sure viewers... Shuffling, hobbling. Well, yeah, viewers will want to know. How's it going? It was it was, it was, was three very hard-working, long and pretty painful days, but I'm still in the trainers. I'll try to get back in the pointy shoes next week. But, well, you yeah. are an absolute soldier, and we are grateful for that. But it, it was a major occasion, wasn't it, with the French pulling out all the stops. Do you think it'll be viewed as a success by the palace? Uh, definitely. And I have to say, I've covered a lot of state visits over the years, and this was, I think, definitely up there in terms of um, guess, setting out to achieve stuff and actually achieving it. The, the warmth of the welcome from President Macron and his wife, and also of, of the crowds as well. I mean, you, you never know what you're going to get, and their opportunities to mingle uh, with the crowds were limited because obviously there'd been such security, big security issues in France. But when they were allowed to, thousands of people turned up, and there were lots of cries of Vive le roi, you know, which I think is probably the first time in several hundred years they've heard that in France. I would, I would never have thought that the French would that bothered about our royal family. I would have thought they'd be too cool for it, yeah. but far from it. The um, one thing I've learned through meeting some kind of new friends on some of the um, uh, French magazines, celebrity magazines, the royal family are, are, are big sellers for them in terms of, and apparently uh, one of the big consumers of it is actually Madame Macron. She loves reading about the British royal family, particularly the Princess of Wales, apparently. Oh my goodness, but yeah. well, she must have been having a, you know, been so excited and stressed about what to wear and what to say and all of those yeah. sorts of things. But we've had news this week as well, haven't we, of a state visit coming to Britain soon? We have one that might quite excite you, Joe. I don't know what uh, you're implying. <laughs> um, we, uh, Buckingham Palace have announced we'll, in November uh, the President of the Republic of Korea, in other words, South Korea as we know it, is coming to the UK for a state visit. Um, details will be announced, but obviously we'll see things like a state banquet and showing them around the royal collection. I think what's interesting about this is people often ask, why do they pick these particular countries to invite and obviously those invitations are made at the request of the government and the foreign office and I was doing a bit of research into this and I think South Korea is uh, it's our 20th biggest trading partner and one of the you know a really big investor into the UK so you can see why the British government wants that and there's obviously a lot going on globally with North Korea Russia weapons yeah. Ukraine so you can see how important they view these things uh, these state visits and the power of soft diplomacy of the royal family in a much bigger global global picture I think we ought to say that Joe is a huge fan of Korean pop music yeah so. no well, you um, were telling me, Rebecca, you were telling me that they might bring some famous people. If they bring anyone from BTS, well, then they're going to have to have extra security. Just you, saying. You, just saying. You can yeah. come inside my handbag, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> do you promise? <laughs> I will do my best. Oh, please, Kim Namjoon, come to London. We, we need to see you. But now, moving on, everybody. Richard, despite the big picture-perfect events in Versailles and so on, there were some reports that courtiers were a little disgruntled behind the scenes of the French visit. Um, yeah, this refers to a, a report by the new royal correspondent to the Mail on Sunday, Natasha Livingston, and she was reporting on some tensions behind the scenes. You know, it, the relations don't seem to have been, um, should we say, formidable between um, the Elysee Palace and um, the British embassy officials who were dealing with the trip, and there seemed to have been some tensions. The, I mean, the visit came at a difficult time because Pope Francis had been visiting Marseille. We've got the Rugby World Cup, so everyone's got a sort of lot on their plate in terms of organisation in France at the moment. Mm. And um, 
I think, to be honest, there's always a few kind of tensions over these things, but it seems to be between French, English officials. You know what the French and English are like. There's always a bit of rivalry there. No. <laughs> a bit of La Rosse beef. No. <laughs> but no, 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 nothing, um, nothing too major. OK, well, good to hear. Now, Rebecca, you also revealed a particularly low-key style secret of the Queen's, didn't you? Well, I just felt like she'd had a bit of a glow up on this trip. I thought you know, she looked I thought amazing. She, you know, the, the, from the style to the hair to the makeup, and I thought oh, I'll do a nice little piece of this on on Sunday, on Saturday's paper in the Daily Mail because I just thought she was looking great. So I kind of set about trying to find out what was the secret to this, and one of the the kind of theories I had is maybe she'd got a new um, makeup artist. And I kind of asked a few people who might know, and the question came back basically saying, uh, Her Majesty does her own makeup, Rebecca, thank you very much. Um, and, and I think for 76 years six year old, you'll have a look, maybe we can show some pictures at the, um, at the state banquet at Versailles. You know, she was really glowing, her makeup looked fantastic. Why does our think Queen have to do her own makeup? Maybe some people just prefer it, I guess. Mm. She's pretty lucky. She had a makeup artist to start off with just after she married the then Prince of Wales to do the, you know, big public appearances and tours. But when you see kind of behind the scenes, I might see if I can find some footage of this, the kind of the kind of phalanx of, um, of cameras and the flash bulbs going off. You know, you've got to be mm. pretty confident with yourself to go there doing your own your own makeup because you know that people are going to be pouring over what you look like in, mm. on, online, in the next day's newspapers, in the magazines. I thought she looked great. Didn't our Princess of Wales do her own makeup for her wedding? She did, yeah. Mm. I mean, she does her own makeup, but obviously she does have the advantage of being kind of 30, 30 years younger, and as you get older, yeah. <laughs> as long as I know, <laughs> you know, it gets more difficult uh, to, you know, to hide the wrinkles. Um, mm. And I, there was a lovely moment, actually, I should say, at the state visit, which I thought was brilliant, um, because I noticed over the three days um, Queen Camilla and Madame Macron seemed to get on really well. Um, and there was a great moment she, she stepped out of the state Bentley and she had this beautiful Dior dress and gown and it kind of slipped off her shoulder and straight away Madame Macron kind of came round and fixed it for her. I thought that was a real kind of girl code moment on the red carpet they, so they both look good. Do they speak to each other in English or French? English. I mean Camilla did give a speech in French but she would be the first to admit it's kind of you know schoolgirl rusty French. She gave it a go mm. but they, they definitely spoke in English together. Gosh, that's impressive. Now, Richard, back to you for more disgruntlement. <laughs> and <laughs> you do it so well. <laughs> and there, there, there was a rather baffling protest at the palace this week. Oh, they were terribly proud of this. This was the, um, the main sort of Republican movement in Britain um, called for Republic. And they organised this process. They were boasting about how they'd managed to get inside Buckingham Palace to stage this process the first time there'd ever been a demonstration inside Buckingham Palace. Well, people were quick to point out the reason they got inside the palace was because they bought tickets like anyone else. <laughs> so ah, I see their cunning plan. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure the royal family is very grateful. Um, so anyway, well, all they did was they sort of unveiled their T-shirts, you know, during their trip, which was not my king. Um, they weren't terribly well organised, so it didn't really spell out very clearly not my king. They were sort of standing in the wrong places. So I think. Um, you know, full marks for the, you know, organising such a stump. But next time they need to work on the details maybe a little bit better. Yes, what was the goal? Um, uh, just publicity, really. Um, oh, well, there you go, that worked. <laughs> <laughs> tick, tick, tick. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca, Catherine's been very busy this week, hasn't she? She has. It, it feels like we're really kind of back into the new school term. And uh, so she was doing three engagements this week. And actually, I went up with her to Leeds because she was visiting a brilliant success story of British industry, this textiles company called A.W. Hainsworth. Um, they make everything from kind of military uniforms to fire and police uniforms, but also supply fabrics for Chanel, Balenciaga. I mean, they're an amazing success story. And there was a lovely side story to it because her own family on her father's side owned over many generations ago a very successful textile business as well. One, uh, one time, apparently, it was worth kind of close to £32 million. Pounds. Um, so, you know, a hugely successful kind of Victorian success story. And uh, they sold, some of her ancestors sold it to this company. So there was a nice link for her to, to go and see what they'd done. And actually, they still make some of the items her family business did 
now, which are these, um, you'll probably know this, co mm -hmm. collar meltons, which mm. is apparently is the oh, little bit of fabric that, that goes underneath the collar, I think, to help it drape properly. Collar what? Collar meltons. Wow, every right. day's a school day, isn't exactly. it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I learned something new this week. Yeah. Um, and it you is can an see interesting she was, link, yeah. she was really passionate about it. So, and I, there's, uh, we've got a few more engagements coming up next week. So those that like the Prince of Wales and their work, they'll see her a lot over the next few weeks. Well, Richard, the link to Catherine's family firm is quite interesting, isn't it? Uh, it really is, because not only is there that history, but her family has sort of inherited that business entrepreneurship you know, they went on after having jobs um, for airlines. Um, Catherine's parents created the company Party Pieces, selling party paraphernalia, made a lot of money over the years. Um, but then sadly, it went bust mm. early this year with big debt. So it sort of ended um, badly. But over the years, they, they did make a lot of money from it. Mm. Well, we'll have more on Catherine and her role as peacemaker between Harry and William in just a moment. But first, your comments now and plenty of you were delighted with the Prince of Wales's trip to New York. Sky Jumper writes, after Harry's car chase debacle and Andrew's escapades, William's visit to NYC has restored respect from us Americans again. DW says William is the son who inherited both his parents' best gifts, child's intelligence and sense of duty and Diana's charisma and kindness. She would be proud of him. And Lisa writes, I'm an American that grew up in Southern California and works in entertainment, and we definitely love the royals and the UK above our own celebrities and politicians. Well, we definitely love bringing you all their news. Thanks for all your comments. Please keep them coming. Now, let's start this section with a comment from the BBC's former royal correspondent, Jenny Bond, who spoke to OK! magazine this week about William and Harry's rift and Catherine's attempts to heal things. Reflecting on the fact that the Princess of Wales comes from a happy and united family, she says, I think she believed the rift could be fixed. And after Prince Philip's funeral, we saw her talking with Harry and obviously encouraging William to do the same. But we now know that it didn't work. And in fact, William and Harry had a blazing row right after the funeral. Richard, if this is accurate, this really does show how magnanimous Catherine can be, doesn't it? I think so, because let's put this in context that, you know, at that point they'd already had, Harry and Meghan had given their interview, notorious interview to Oprah Winfrey mm. that had been broadcast while Prince Philip was dying in hospital. Obviously he died the next month and this um, happened at the, the funeral, um, but in that interview you know, they had said terrible things. They yeah. had, you know, really upset the whole family. But we saw Catherine trying to mend fences a bit. I think trying to be just civil, really, just trying to sort of, you know, it's a funeral, everyone's together, probably making small talk, this type of thing. Um, I think that just shows her general, um, you know, good manners and trying to be the peacemaker. Yeah, it's Rebecca, Jenny Bond also said that I mean, obviously the royal family probably have very few people that they can turn to for advice or just to let off some steam with. So in that context, Catherine must be a real rock to William in so many ways. She is. I think she's given him and, and her family that kind of the sense of belonging that he didn't necessarily experience his own upbringing being caught between two warring parents. Um, and you're right, trust is a big issue for them. Who can they trust? Who can they talk to? And William, e even more so, I would say, than, than many others. Um, and they are, you know, as close as you come. Um, I know he's very proud of her and how she's assimilated herself into the royal family, how she's conducted herself. He's really proud of the public work that she's been developing, particularly with the early years, mental health. Um, you know, they really are inseparable. And people I know who speak to them say they live such an ordinary life outside of the public engagement you see that you see them in you know going to watch their kids play sports you know going off you know down the high street shopping with the kids on the scooters and that's very very grounding for William and yeah it's, it's very important for him to have someone in his life that he can 100 percent trust mm. and I think it has to be said that you know William's sort of reluctance to mend fences with his brother you know, he had good reason for his suspicions because they then went on to publish Harry's book and all those interviews and all the terrible things in that book and then produce the Netflix series as well. So you, you, I think it just shows how sensible William was to um, try and just put that a bit of edge between him and bit of distance between him and Harry. And I know he was particularly angry about some of the things that Harry said about his wife 
in the book. Yeah. In particular, you know, her what was interpreted as coldness towards Megan and to the relationship, where actually it's probably, as we've said, you know, just being very careful about who you bring in your life and learning that you can trust them. Um, mm. and he was very, very hurt and very angry about that. So, Richard, I want to turn to a piece in the Sunday Times now and the suggestion that palace courtiers are discussing buying a home for Harry and Meghan in the UK. Now, this might seem extraordinary, but it's because Prince Harry remains a councillor of state. Now, that role is important because it's um, they are the members of the royal family who would step in if the monarch's um, not available. You know, he's, if he's away and something happens, and you know, so it does have an important um, role to play. Anyway, the, the Sunday Times is pointing out that councillors of state do have to be domiciled; they have to have a, a home in in Britain, and Harry doesn't have one. So, Rebecca taking the other side for a moment, it would stop the speculation that happens every time Harry's coming to town. Where will he stay? Will he stay with the, ki with the king? Will he not? You know, I suppose it ends all of that, doesn't it? Yeah, so a couple of things. I, I've made some inquiries too, and it, everyone I've spoken to has very firmly denied the suggestion that was made at the weekend that they were going to give, look at giving Harry a permanent home at Kensington Palace. And there's quite a lot of incredulity about that. They're saying, it's not going to happen, and why would we give him a home next to you know, the offices and the, the home office set up of the brother he no longer speaks to? Uh, it, w it would just be too weird in every sense of the word. But what they do want to do is find a way that, as long as they're given enough notice that they can get things sorted out for him, that they would give him somewhere to stay when he and possibly his family come over in the future, just on an ad hoc basis. They haven't said where. My guess from knowing the setup, I think it would probably be at somewhere like St James's Palace, maybe even Clarence House, because, you know, the King and Queen are in different places, Clarence House is somewhere where Harry grew up. I think St James's Palace personally is more likely. There's a little bit more wiggle room on, on places he could stay there. Princess Anne, for example, has got an overnight place there as well. They can't stay in Buckingham Palace. No one will be in Buckingham Palace for several years because it's still a building site in many ways. Uh, Windsor's a bit more tricky. Um, so I think they are trying to find a way for him to be allowed to stay so he doesn't feel totally pushed out. But I think the idea of him ever getting anything permanent, certainly in the near future, is, is a no-goer. Richard, some people might say, and I think I, I might be some of those people, um, the King was willing to take away Harry's home, but not this councillor of state role. We've been talking about this for years now. Yeah, no, the situation is crazy because, you know, I was among those who applauded um, King Charles when he evicted Harry and Meghan from their home. Oh, that we had, remember. That yeah. had been given to them as a gift by Queen Elizabeth at Frogmore Cottage, but they were told to leave it on the basis that they're not working members of the royal family. So, you know, when you um, say, you know, we're not going to do our job anymore, you lose the perks that come with that job. It makes sense. So, you know, why on earth should they have to be finding any royal residence for them now? There's a simple answer is he needs to be cut out as a councillor of state. What um, the King did instead was last November he asked Parliament to allow Princess Anne and Prince Edward to be added to the councillors of state. Mm. And it was thought that that way it means we won't have to use Harry. It was a sort of cop-out, but we won't annoy him too much. Well, just don't worry about annoying him too much. It just needs to be done. It would be a quick request to Parliament again to cut off Prince Harry um, as a council of state, and I would say also Prince Andrew. But presumably Prince Harry wouldn't even be that interested in being a council of state anymore. I'm not sure. I mean, it seems to um, bring with it great advantages because they've got them now worrying about how, how do we house him or whatever. No, no, he should stay at a hotel same as anyone else. There's mm -hmm. no need for him to have a royal residence when he essentially has nothing to do with the royal family anymore. It's fascinating. There's also the argument, Rebecca, isn't there, that if he gets a new UK house in one of the royal estates, it could potentially alleviate this sort of potentially embarrassing legal case against the Home Office. I mean, it, it could do. There's, there's a whole range of benefits I, to, to them, I think, of at least allowing him to stay and keeping him slightly in the fold by offering him a, a place to stay on one of the royal residences. I mean, just going back to the councils of state issue, I mean, I have to say, I do agree with Richard on this because the 1943, I think it is, Regency Act is very clear on this. The councils of state are 
the spouse of the, the sovereign and the next four in line to the throne. They have to be of, of age, as in voting age, um, and um, they also have to be domiciled in the UK. Now, I've put my feelers out to kind of see what the feeling is behind the scenes on this. No one will speak about it very openly. Um, and their feeling is that to be taking that away from him might be seen as a bit of a low blow. He's had a lot taken away from him over the last couple of years. Many people would say, rightly so. Yes, because um, it's, it's taken away from someone who walked away. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, I, and, and they say that there's enough kind of wiggle room around this issue of domicile, whether it means a permanent base in the UK or whether he would just have to be, into the UK, be in the UK physically to make those decisions. But I, I do agree with Richard. It's a very unsatisfactory state of affairs. And I, I cannot see how he, the Duke of York, and Princess Beatrice, none of them were working royals. Why on earth they should be decide, you know, able to decide, decision, make decisions or you know, support the king in that really formal constitutional way? It just seems farcical. Um, imagine you've got a great new job. You get a lovely um, company car as part of that. You get health care. You get use of the company gym. No, I can't. I can't. That's <laughs> well outside of my imagination. And then you say, yeah. look, I'm quitting. I don't want to do it. I want to go and make loads of money on the side. Say, so, OK, fair enough. Oh, no, but actually, I want to keep the car. And I'd like the benefits, and I want to use the gym. Where can I send my CV for that job? <laughs> that sounds fabulous. Do they you need know. me as a councillor of state? Yeah. You know, I think the situation is like that. It is absurd. I mean, what could possibly go wrong, right? It, it's going to get messy, isn't it? I, th I think it is, um, because it sounds like it has to be resolved one way or another, really, that I suspect what may happen is what Rebecca's suggesting that Harry will have, because he's got lots of court cases coming up. He will be visiting quite regularly. <laughs> and right. um, and yeah. he probably will have a kind of regular royal residence that will end up being put down as his sort of domicile. And that, that's not satisfactory, really, I don't think. I love the idea that, you know, choosing one palace or another. Which one? Which well, one? They, and that is actually genuinely a problem, because <laughs> <laughs> they... they, they they don't, they're not awash with suitable places for him to live. You know, the places that, you know, someone, a member of the royal family with all the security and the staff that come with it, they're, they're actually few and far between. They tend, on the whole, to be occupied. Um, and the actual, I mean, I know people who've, a lot over the years who've stayed in the other rooms in the palaces, and they're like tiny little, like, um, you know, boarding school, um, tiny little dorms, you know, what they call fish and f fish finger beds, you know, that you kind of lie in like that. It, it's not glamorous. So yeah. they, and equally, a bit like Frogmore, and this has been the issue with Frogmore, they don't want to have an entire property that's empty most of the year round because it's a really bad look and they no, could rent it out. To so keep Prince Harry happy, it will have to be a very nice room. In his book, um, readers will remember that he, he went on about getting the worst room at Balmoral. <laughs> yes. He said, oh, it was sort of in the servants quarters and everything and he, he remembered that you know it was like 30 years later and you want to give him a fish finger bed i've never <laughs> i've never so today i've learned collar what's it called collar melton collar melton's and fish finger beds i've never heard either there of those things see come before. to palace confidential it's, it's an palace educational experience i'm just a poor girl from the colonies i don't know your language anyway well we've got no more time today but we couldn't end the program without some more of the great pictures from the king and queen's state visit to france enjoy these
always have Paris. Wonderful pictures there. As always, if you enjoy our content, remember to link and subscribe. It's free. And that way you never need to miss another episode. Thanks to my guests, Rebecca and Richard, and to you for watching. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.